I've already done this one. I've done this one. I've done this one. Yeah, I didn't want to walk over there. Oh, God, that's me. <laughs> That scared me. Well, good morning, Westside. It is great to see you in God's house today. And the pastor is beginning a, a new series this morning in the book of Daniel. So that's going to be really exciting. Uh, Daniel lived in the 6th century B.C. He never preached a message to anybody, but uh, he worked in government most, uh, most all of his career that is described in the scriptures. Uh, he is noted as a man of tremendous courage someone who remained faithful to God when the culture around him was entirely pagan. And so there's some, there are going to be some great lessons for all of us, I'm sure, in the messages in the coming weeks. Uh, Daniel knew something, that if you stand firm, even if it looks like the end, it's not. God's going to make a way. He's going to provide salvation. He's going to provide deliverance. And he had some of the most spectacular deliverances uh, described in uh, the Old Testament. We're going to ask you to stand, if you will, and if you can with us this morning as we sing together about that aspect of God, Waymaker.
working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Good morning. All right, some of y'all are a little more awake than others, but we are thankful nonetheless that you are here on this chilly Sunday morning. I'm going to feel like an airplane attendant as I direct things that are starting up this week and next week. Tonight, Pastor Kyle will be starting the next discipleship class, The Good Life. If you are interested, in coming and you have children, we will have child care starting tonight, but we need you to register um, right outside in the foyer at the table. There's a sheet of paper. Just write down your child's name, their age, and you can come and they will have something fun to do tonight. Also, youth will be starting back tonight. We will continue our study through Ephesians and we were going to be in chapter 5, the second half of that, tonight. Um, Pioneer Club will be starting back, not this Wednesday, but the next. And we are excited to be coming out of the holiday season and getting our activities back so we can all grow in the likeness of God together from our toddlers to our most senior adults that we will all look more like Jesus when he returns. So let us pray that the Spirit will move today and conform us to his image. Father, we are thankful um, that you have just given us a church family that loves one another, that desires to grow with one another, Lord, and I just pray that that will continue throughout the year, Lord, that you will bless our ministries, uh, specifically the children's ministry and the student ministry, Lord, that we will be raising up generations of disciples um, that will follow you for a lifetime, Lord, for our adults, and that they'll just continue to be faithful um, to your word, to grow in your image, Lord. And that as we anticipate your coming, you will prepare us for that, Lord. Thank you for Kyle and his leadership in this new sermon series, Lord. I pray that your spirit will move through him, in us, through our church, Lord. And that we will be used for your kingdom here in Greenwood and throughout the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Salvation begins when you recognize that you are a sinner that you cannot save yourself, and that you need Jesus to save you. If you never acknowledge your need of a Savior, you will never be saved. But even as a believer on a daily basis, you will never receive God's presence, guidance, and help unless you know you need Him every day. Now, we all need Him every day, but we don't always realize that. We don't acknowledge it. And so it is important. This song focuses on expressing the need 
to God that we need him every moment of every day, good times and bad times, times of joy and times of sorrow, times on the mountain and times in the valley. If you're able, would you stand with us together as we sing, Lord, I need you. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found, is where. comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Children, second grade and younger are dismissed at this time for their time of worship. The rest of you may be seated. Again, this uh, final song that we're going to be singing with you and for you this morning is The Lord is My Salvation. The grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea. I am safe on this solid ground. The Lord is my salvation. That's something Daniel could sing, something that we can sing as well. grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea and I am safe on this solid ground the Lord is my salvation I will not fear when darkness falls. His strength will help me scale these walls. 
shall see the dawn of the rising sun. The Lord is my salvation. Sing with us.
that has a cool lion roar that goes with it. (laughs) You'll hear it next week. Uh, We are starting a new series uh, this morning, and this is going to take us Uh, Just shy of Easter, we're going to go through the next uh, 10 weeks or so and look through the book of Daniel. And I'm excited about this book. Uh, Daniel is the last of the five major prophets that uh, we talk about. And Daniel was deported from Judah and was in Babylon. Really, his entire ministry was spent during the the 70-year Babylonian captivity. And, and I think there's a lot to learn from Daniel because of, there are about 3,000 characters in the Bible. If you take Old Testament and New Testament, there are over 3,000 characters. Of those 3,000 characters, Daniel is one of the few. Like him, Jesus, and that's about it, where uh, there's really no negative things said about them ever in Scripture. Daniel was known to have been uh, a person uh, of high character, and was he perfect? No. No one is perfect aside from Jesus Christ that has been here on earth. And so, no, he was not perfect. But I think there is a lot to learn from his character. And some of the qualities that we will see through these weeks of study in the book of Daniel that we'll see that characterize his life are are things like faith and he prayer was important to Daniel. He had courage. He was a man of consistency, and he was also uncompromising in what he believed. And he needed those qualities in the situation that he was in, being taken from his homeland and everything that he knew as a young teenager and placed in this foreign Babylon, which had a a whole different a whole different way of life, a whole different religion. Uh, uh, Everything was different. And as a teenager, he was forced into this world, in this godless empire that he was forced into. It was a very anti-Christian culture that he was forced into. And I don't think you have to be very creative to think about why I think this book will be beneficial for us. I'm not saying that America is Babylon, but I I can say that we are are less Christian as a nation than we were a generation ago or two generations ago. We are in an ever-increasing secular society. And so just as Daniel needed these character traits in the world in which he was in, we need them as well. We need them as a church, but we need them as individuals as well. And so uh, we need to be a church that is marked by faith. We need to be a church that holds prayer in high regard. We need to be a church that has courage, that is consistent, that is uncompromising. These character qualities that we'll see in Daniel are qualities that we need as individuals and as a church as a denomination, because there is a lot of pressure on churches to compromise, to give in to secular society. Many denominations have already done it. Uh, In the the 50s and and 60s, when when churches were kind of held uh, to the fire, many caved during that time. Thankfully, our denomination uh, has made a resurgence in, in commitment to the Bible and the integrity of God's Word and the inerrancy of God's Word, but many denominations have not. And so uh, we're going to look now at this story of Daniel. And uh, Daniel's message over the course of this book study is, is that we can stand strong and, and trust God even in difficult circumstances because we serve a God who is sovereign. We serve a God who who will hold those that oppose him accountable. And in the end, God will replace this kingdom with an eternal kingdom. And because of those things, we can stand strong. We can have courage even in difficult circumstances. 
Because ultimately, Daniel is a lesson for all of us on how to be a faithful witness in, in a dark and even sometimes hostile environment. And so, let's look now. We're going to start where we should start. Chapter 1, verse 1, uh, as we go through this book of Daniel together. Uh, we may get a chapter a week. I'm not promising that. We'll probably have to split a few chapters. But uh, we are going to get through chapter 1 uh, this week together. And so chapter 1, verse 1, there are going to be a lot of names in Daniel that I will probably butcher. I'm just going to let you know. I am from South Carolina, and I, I speak English. And so some of these names, uh, you know. Yes, I did go to seminary. Yes, I did learn as much as I could, but, you know, we'll try. All right, Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord je gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Verse 3, Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, the chief Enoch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the, God, in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. And the king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. And they were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. And among these were Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. You know these. Learned them in Sunday school. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. And so we're introduced here from the start of Daniel to a very difficult situation. These four teenage boys were taken as, as captives. And ultimately, they were forced into, into a very hostile and godless country of Babylon. But even in this difficult circumstance where Daniel and, and three guys that had, that had great reputations or without blemish, young teenagers, as they were taken from their homeland of Judah, taken to Babylon, we see that even in this difficult circumstance that we start this book in, we are going to see that even in this difficulty, God has a purpose. God still has a plan. There is a lesson here because at the surface we look at this and think, where is God that these four young men were taken from their homeland and forced into this godless country of Babylon? How has he let this happen? At the surface, those are the questions that pop into our mind. But this is God's plan. He has a purpose in doing this. God is still at work, even though the entire situation of captivity is ultimately a result of the disobedience of Judah, and this is the judgment of God. But even in judgment, God is at work. Despite the sin, despite the rebellion of his people, he's using these four boys to transform a culture. He is at work here, even in a difficult circumstance. God is sending these four courageous teenagers into a land of idols, into a land of paganism. God is, is, is invading this Babylon, this earthly kingdom with, with a heavenly kingdom. This is, it's a small army, I'll give you that. It's an army of four guys, but this is, is God's army marching right into the opposition's home base. I mean, God is, is orchestrating these four young boys to be right in the middle of Babylon. 
And, it, and the fact that it's only four teenagers only points to the power of God. Because what they are going to accomplish, only God can do as he uses these four young teenagers to accomplish his work. Uh, it, it only points to God and his power at work in their lives. And so when you think about this situation, unfortunately, it's not too dissimilar from college students going off to school. <laughs> Uh, as, as, as these boys are they're isolated from their home, their church, they're, they're susceptible to new ideas. They're now enrolled in a three-year school that the king is putting them in. And it's basically, uh, the whole plan is it's three years of indoctrination. The, the University of, of Babylon, uh, that these, three bo- these four boys are being forced to go to for three years, it, it is, they are not learning what they grew up knowing. Uh, the classes that they're going to have are things like astrology and the mythologies of Babylon, the, the polytheistic deities of the ancient Near East. This is, this is what they are going to be taught in this school. And the goal was that the king had was to assimilate these four teenagers as much as possible into Babylon by, by teaching them, indoctrinating them, and that's why they changed their names. They, they changed the names of these four boys. This was a big deal in that day. I realize now we just think of, well, a name change, you know, you just go through the paperwork and file it with the court and it, you know, it's a name change. This was a big deal in this culture. Your, your name was your identity. There, there was so much meaning and, and purpose behind a name in this culture. Daniel's name meant God is my judge. Hananiah's name meant God is gracious. Mishael's meant who is like God. Azariah's meant God helps. So you can see why the Babylonians wanted to change the names of these four guys as they come into their culture. I don't believe in the monotheistic God that these four do. And so immediately they say, well, we got we to gotta make them Babylonians. Let's change their names. They can't have names that are honoring their God. So their names are changed. Now let's continue the story. Verse 8. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I hear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were... that? Why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who, were, who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Verse 11, Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, Test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. And then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. And so he listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. And at the end of the ten days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. And so the steward took away their food and wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And at the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. And therefore they stood before the king. Verse 20. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding, 
about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. And so we have this test of faith for these four teenage boys. They were held in captivity. Here they are in this school, and they're being served the king's food, which at face value, you say, well, well, that sounds like pretty good food. And, and that's pretty generous considering, I mean, they are prisoners. They are held captive, and here they are being served the king's food. Well, the royal food would have included many things that were forbidden for Israelites to eat and drink in the Old Testament. And so this test of faith was whether they would conform to God's word or cave to the culture of Babylon. This was a significant test. And it, it, it may seem like a little thing. It, I mean, this isn't a, a big deal. Well, faithfulness to God... And a commitment to not compromise in the big things begins with being faithful even in the little things. We have seen that in our own lives. It begins with being faithful and uncompromising in little things. Because it's when those big things that happen, when we have that backbone of not compromising and even small things in life, that we have the fortitude and the courage to stand when it is even bigger things. And so Daniel, in an act of courage, asks for only vegetables and water for 10 days. Maybe that should be some of your New Year's resolutions (laughs) to try that. Uh, let me know how that goes. I am not making that commitment to only eat vegetables and drink water. Uh, I just I couldn't do it. I could go 10 days without eating vegetables or drinking water. And pr- I'd be pretty... Su- I'm try that one. This is about Hayes' diet, though, so she, she's pretty successful at it. I would not be. But uh, unless... Let me, unless God directs me to do that. Uh, I'm not going to plan on it, but he hasn't yet. And so notice that Daniel, and this is a bold request. Uh, This could have really turned out bad for him. This could have, I mean, remember, he's a captive. They could have just said, off with you. This is a, a bold request, but he's not rude in his convictions. You know how sometimes <laughs> I, we stand, many Christians stand on convictions, but the way in which they stand on their convictions is kind of rude or, or arrogant or even obnoxious sometimes or kind of a holier than thou that, well, actually, this is not how Daniel approached this. He wasn't any of those things. His response had grace. His response had humility. There was wisdom there, that he's standing his ground, but not in an obnoxious way. And he's showing wisdom in that he presents a a plan and a a solution that can be a win-win for this, this chief officer of the king and also for Daniel and his three other comrades. And God blesses them. As Daniel stands on his convictions, God blesses it. There is a a principle being taught here that when you commit to doing things God's way, God God will glorify himself. This isn't a magic formula because sometimes we'll see in Daniel that you do the right thing, you stand on your conviction, and as a result, you may suffer. But I'm telling you that the constant and consistent biblical principle is that when you honor God, God honors you in return. That's not a formula. Daniel's going to stand on conviction at times and suffer as a result. Sometimes we stand on our convictions and it may mean losing a job. This isn't a magic formula that you do, you honor God, you stand on conviction and he just blesses you in, in, sometimes we suffer. But even in that suffering, when we stand on our convictions, God is honored. God is 
glorified. God is pleased. You will find your reward. If it's not on this side of eternity, you will receive that award for all of eternity. We are called to honor God in that way. Does it always mean that everything's going to work out perfect? That, that when we stand our convictions, the king will say, okay, and everything will go hunky-dory. No. Sometimes that's not the response. But, again, we stand our convictions not to please man, but to honor God. And that is what Daniel is doing. And ultimately, we see here, and kind of the point that I want us to leave with, even though I have a few points, uh, if you want to make a difference like Daniel is doing here, you have to be different. If you want to make a difference in, in culture, in, in the culture around you, then you have to be different. I'm not talking about being weird, but faithfulness to God in a culture that doesn't reflect God is a calling for us to be different. If we are going to reflect God in a culture that does not reflect God, then when we reflect God, we are going to look different than the culture around us. These four Hebrew teenagers, they were guided by the Bible, not by Babylon. Their allegiance was to God, not to the king. And because of that, these four appeared different. They were different. But if you're going to transform culture and not be transformed by culture, then we must be different. And so as application this morning, let's look at a few ways that we are to be different in order to transform our culture. The first point I'd like to make is in order to transform culture, we must live according to different values. As Christians... You and I represent another kingdom. We live by a different set of values than the earthly kingdom. We live for a heavenly kingdom. These four teenagers were God's chosen people. They lived by a different set of values than the Babylonians. In the same way that our values should be completely different from the world around us. And we see it most evident. St. Augustine said this, which is not recent, but man, is it prevalent today. St. Augustine said that followers of Jesus are most distinguishable from the world in their attitudes toward three things. Money, sex, and power. That the way we value those three things. Our set of values that surrounds those three big things of life should be completely different than the world. Babylon approached money only from the standpoint of acquisition. Get all you can. Keep all you can. Because to them, money is, is the lifeblood and the key to the good life, which is the study that we're going to start tonight in discipleship. But for a believer... We should have a different attitude toward money. God is our treasure. Sure, money is how we live, but we also recognize that that money is something entrusted to us by God, ultimately to further and advance His kingdom. Babylon also approached sex very differently. They didn't have right or wrong. It's just whatever seemed right to them, whatever felt best. That is what their value was. We value it as a gift of God that should be used for His purposes and according to His design. That is a completely different set of values. Babylon approached power differently with the idea that whatever power you have, you exploit it. Whatever power you have, you exploit it to your advantage. The kingdom of God values others above self. And so as a follower of Christ, we ask, how can I use this position of power that I have to lift others up around me? It's a different set of values. And so as believers, we live according to different values. And as we live according to different values than the lost culture around us, we are going to look 
different. But it's only in being different that we can be salt and light in our culture. Second, in order to transform culture, we must refuse to compromise our integrity. These four Hebrew boys did not compromise their convictions. Even when doing so could have threatened and cost them their lives. Refusing orders from the king could have meant death. But as followers, God, convictions are not something that can be set aside. Now, sometimes we honor God and in integrity we stand on our convictions and there are times God blesses that like he did here. We get the promotion. But sometimes we live with integrity in our convictions and we refuse to compromise and sometimes it's not a good result on this side of heaven. But even in suffering, even in persecution, like we're going to see in the life of Daniel, God uses our refusal to compromise as a vehicle in which he will show off his power and bring glory to his name. And so in order to transform culture, we must, like Daniel and his friends, refuse to compromise our integrity. Third, in order to transform culture, we must conform to Scripture and not culture. Living by the values of God's kingdom as found in Scripture is always countercultural. And the question is, is what we will do with these things that our culture today requires or pressures us to conform to. Whatever the royal food is that they require to be eaten. Martin Luther said this, that the courage of the soldier is tested in how well he stands where the battle is the hottest. Not in how brave he postures himself where the battle has passed. If we are to have the courage of Daniel. It, it takes us standing firm on God's word, even on the hotbed issues in our culture. It's what we're called to do, to be transformers of culture, not people who are transformed by culture. And fourth, and the last point, in order to transform culture, we must surround ourselves with people moving in the same direction. Daniel was not alone in Babylon. Daniel had the strength of three others that were alongside him that could offer that encouragement, that provided that accountability. We need that in our lives. It's hard to live as aliens or as strangers in a foreign land. It's not easy to live counter-culturally. It's not always easy to be in the minority. We need the encouragement of, of fellow believers. We need the accountability of fellow believers. We need to know that we are not alone. Ecclesiastes says that a cord of three strands is not easily broken. We need that fellowship. And I think it happens best in our Bible study groups. Yes, there is accountability and fellowship in this room. But this isn't the best avenue for accountability and fellowship. It happens in those small groups, and we know that there are people alongside us that will hold us accountable, that will ask us those questions, that will offer that encouragement that we need to be transformers, not those who are transformed by the culture around us. In the New Testament, Jesus compares our witness to being salt. Salt preserves. Salt even enhances food. But if salt has lost its saltiness, Jesus said it's 
worthless. It's just powder. It does no good. The same thing is true of Christians that conform to this world. If they've lost their saltiness, if, if they're not a light, if there's nothing different about the church, is there, if there's nothing different about you and I as followers of Christ than, than the culture around us, then we've, we've been transformed by the culture. We haven't transformed anything. It, it's, it's, it's worthless. We aren't pointing to a, a greater life. We aren't pointing to a Savior if our life is no different than the world around us. And unfortunately, the church at large, not this church, but the church internationally, hasn't always had the courage to stand against culture. They have folded oftentimes, but we are called to stand on the truths of God's Word. And if you and I want to make a difference, we've got to be a little different, (laughs) And I don't mean weird. I don't want West Side to be, oh, yeah, they're weird. Oh, you go to that church? Yeah, they are a weird group of people. That's not the take home from this, please. (laughs) I don't be the pastor of a bunch of weirdos. But we are called to be different. There should be something different about our lives. We live for another kingdom, and it's not this earthly one. We have a different set of values. We have a a different way of life that we have been taught from God's Word. And as we live that out, it is going to appear different. And with each passing year, as we see culture moving further and further away from Christ, further and further away from the truths of God's Word, we are going to stand out even more as different. But that's not a bad thing. Because in our differences, we point to Christ. That is how we can be salt and light. That is how we can transform culture, not be transformed by culture. So I'm looking forward to these next few weeks. As we study this life of Daniel, as we see his convictions, his courage in a in a growingly hostile environment of Babylon, I think it will be a great example for each of us. But again, this isn't pointing to how great Daniel is. This is pointing to the power of God in Daniel's life. It's not that he's someone that we can't be. As we surrender our lives to Christ and are filled with his Holy Spirit, you and I, can stand in courage and on our convictions just like Daniel. There's nothing special about him other than he was surrendered to God and had faith to rely on him even in a difficult situation. So you and I can have that as well. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truths we see in this story. Father, this was a difficult situation in Daniel's life, being torn from home, sent to a very hostile environment. But Father, even in this difficult situation in Daniel's life, we can see you at work. And Father, we can testify to that this morning, that even during difficult circumstances in our lives, you have proven yourself faithful. And so, Father, we pray this morning that you will empower us as a church to stand on the convictions and the truth of your word, but, Father, also as individuals. May we live in such a way that points to Christ. This week, as people watch our lives, the decisions we make, the priorities that we have, the words that we speak, may people see something different about us. And may that difference point to Christ. Father, may lives be changed from we as individuals and we as a church living differently in our culture. We pray that you strengthen us to do that. We pray these things in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen.
As we stand together and sing this final song, commit to being different in the culture around you. Let's stand together and sing. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Thank you for being here this morning. Don't forget, we have a new discipleship class starting back tonight at 6. If you need child care, let us know at the form on the table in the foyer. But again, thank you for being here this morning. You're dismissed. <laughs>